Well, first of all, let me say thank you to my, my former colleague and great personal friend, Jim Sasser, and uh, how fortunate both of our nations were, both the United States and China, to have Jim Sasser uh, serve as our ambassador. How about another round of applause for great distinguished services of, of, of Jim? Who's here this evening with his lovely wife, Mary. Mary, it's good to be with you again as well, and uh, such great fondness of our time together in the United States Senate, and to be with all of you and with Jim, obviously, this evening as well. Ambassador Shui, and uh, again, uh, Ambassador Roy, uh, we're here this evening, and uh, uh, Ralph Carter with FedEx, I know as well, and uh, my colleagues in the Congress, I saw Brad Sherman's right here, and as well, uh, Grace Meng, who is uh, with us this evening. It's a pleasure to be with all of it, and I'm particularly honored to be sharing uh, this evening uh, with Chaz. And I want to congratulate you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for being a recipient this evening of uh, one of these awards. It's truly, uh, truly an honor to be a part of the Policy uh, Foundation, U.S.-China Policy Foundation, and I'm grateful to the, uh, for the very nice honor that you bestowed this evening. I'd be remiss as well if I didn't also introduce my wife, Jackie, who's here this evening, who's traveled to China many times herself. So, Jackie, thanks for coming out tonight. I appreciate it very much to see you this evening and be with you. I heard Jim, of course, say that I, you've heard that I, I spent my years in the United States Senate and now have become part of the movie business. And I get often asked, what are the similarities between serving in the United States Congress and <laughs> serving in the movie business? Well, I left one group of bad actors for another group of bad actors. <laughs> I've been using that line too often, I think. It's going to have to try to find a new one. Uh, but I'm enjoying it immensely and, uh, and of course, uh, had a great, great experience of serving in the Congress uh, for those years. And I appreciate Jim very much, mentioning my father as well, who had a long career in public service. And uh, so it's truly an honor to be with all of you this evening in such a distinguished gathering. And let me share a few thoughts. With you, if I may, uh, uh, take the opportunity you've given me to talk a little bit about this, uh, particularly this role I've had now in the last few years of representing the six largest media companies in the United States in the home of some of the most iconic film companies going back a century uh, when they first really began their work literally in 1912, 1911, 1913. And this relationship between the United States film industry and China has been a growing one and a fascinating one and deserves, I think, some, some recognition. A little over three decades, of course, ago, the world watched uh, China's emergence on the international stage with a mixture of excitement and uncertainty, quite candidly. Business interests, of course, were saw a billion new uh, consumers uh, for their products, while others, not overly familiar with this new world of power, were more cautious. Feelings many in China, no doubt, shared about those of us in the United States and elsewhere. But over the last 35 years, China has continued opening itself to the world, sharing its culture and its history, and that earlier trepidation has given way to new enthusiasm. This emerging enthusiasm especially, is especially true of the American film industry, a major portion of which, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm very proud to represent. Starting in 1949, no American film could be shown in China. But when Warner Brothers Studios released The Fugitive into Chinese cinemas in 1994, everything began to change. And neither of our two countries, nor the film industries, I might point out, have been the same since. Today, 25 years after the release of The Fugitive, China stands as the world's second largest film market. Chinese audiences are devouring foreign and domestic film content in record numbers. And Chinese filmmakers are creating some of today's most innovative and groundbreaking creative works, what a difference a few years has made. The relationship between the American and Chinese film industries is closer and stronger than many others around the world, I would add. And since joining the Motion Picture Association, I've made it my major goal to strengthen, wherever possible, that relationship uh, between stu the studios that I represent and the People's Republic of China. We at the Motion Picture Association regularly organize film workshops at the Shanghai in Beijing film festivals to support and inspire emerging young Chinese filmmakers. One of my member studios has an exchange program in which young Chinese filmmakers learn about our filmmaking methods here in the United States and Los Angeles. Just last month, the Motion Picture Association co-hosted our fourth annual China co-production film screenings 
in Los Angeles at Paramount Films. During this week-long event, filmmakers screened several co-productions with Chinese filmmakers. Additionally, we co-founded the annual Asian Pacific Screen Awards to help recognize the region's tremendous talent, including many from China's film community. And during the year, uh, during the past year, rather, I have hosted several film screenings here in Washington at the Motion Picture uh, Headquarters on 16th Street. And again, delighted to have members of the Chinese Embassy join us for those, for those engagements. These different opportunities allow our creators to work together. They share knowledge, they learn from one another, and simultaneously grow both of our film industries. And while this relationship uh, matters on a business level, strengthening U.S.-China film relationships has also been important to me, quite candidly, on a personal level, and why I'm so honored to be with you this evening. There is nowhere else in the world I've traveled more often in these last four years to another country around whom I have focused more attention since joining the MPAA than China. And because of those efforts, I've developed close personal relationships with a number of individuals in the Chinese film world. My good friend Tong Gong, the Vice Minister of SARPT, and I have developed a strong, genuine friendship, even though he does not speak a word of English and I don't speak a word of Mandarin, I'm ashamed to say. Whenever we meet, it's far more than just business. We talk about our families, we share stories with each other, and it's often up to our respective staffs to drag us apart and we'd spend all evening talking into the night. All of these efforts are certainly good for business, but they are extremely important on an entirely different level as well. I'm not the Secretary of State, I'm no longer in public life. But I care deeply as an American citizen about U.S.-China relationships. And I can tell you that the strength of that relationship that we have with one another is terribly important. And obviously speaking to the choir, so to speak, this evening with all of you here. Trade, internet governance, digital privacy, energy resources, and so many others, important issues, the resolutions of which will be felt across the globe, have a greater chance of success, in my view, if we can build trust and confidence and through film become more familiar with each other. For it is through storytelling in films and television that the average person, everyday people, in our two countries can become more familiar with each other and our nations. Now, I could spend my entire time during these brief remarks reciting the economic statistics that project a bright future for the film and television industries in both of our nations. The fact that the film market grew nearly 300 percent over the last five years in China and is on track to reach a record five billion dollars by the end of this year. The fact that Chinese exhibitors are building 13 screens every single day in China and that the country's screen count is expected to reach 23,000 by the beginning of 2015. Or the fact that China's internet population grew by 632 million people earlier this year. Those are potential customers, obviously, both in China and for ourselves as well. But as exciting as those numbers are, they do not tell the whole story. I often speak with great pride of how long the American film industry has existed. For more than a century, we have been telling stories that entertain, stories that inform, stories that influence and shape people's views worldwide. China, meanwhile, has been creating art and telling stories continuously for 40 centuries. In fact, had there been a film industry, cameras and projectors around, China today would now be enjoying a 4,000-year-old film industry. Centuries before our forebears met in Philadelphia to declare our independence and form their own nation, long before the settlers first stepped foot on this continent, the Chinese people had already mastered the fine arts. While the Greeks were developing their first written language in 2000 BC, artists Shia dynasty were crafting intricately detailed bronze castings. When Hannibal was crossing the Alps in the third century BC, the imposing warriors of the terracotta army had already been guarding the tomb of the first uh, Qin emperor. And between 1000 and 600 BC, the Book of Odes compiled the earliest analogy of Chinese poetry. And throughout all of that time, Chinese storytellers were telling their ancient tales. Inscribed within the storyteller's house, Zhangzhou, a traditional stronghold of China's Chinese storytelling, is the phrase, and I quote it, <clears throat> past and present are related. Advice is passed along. Good words to enlighten the world. 
instruction infused in amusement. Instruction infused with amusement. This is about as good a descriptor of today's successful films, a good story well told, as you will ever hear, and it is only 3,000 years old. From folk songs to folk tales, legend and myth, stories, those who tell them have long been revered within the Chinese culture. Storytellers like Ti and Chi, who is said to have once initiated the thunderous voice of a legendary hero using silence rather than sound to achieve that, that image. He said that in order to equal a hero's voice, he had to make it, and I quote him, it spring from everyone's heart, and only thus can it be achieved. Generation upon generation, storytellers dedicated their lives to learning and sharing China's ancient stories down through the ages, and those ancient practices continue to exist even today. So while we may dominate today's primary storytelling medium, it's safe to say we will have a great deal to learn from the Chinese friends as well. I believe wholeheartedly that the United States and China have benefited greatly from the mutual exchange of stories and culture which has occurred since the mid-1990s. There's no denying that important differences remain between our nations. We all understand that. We have not always seen eye to eye on important issues, and we will undoubtedly continue to disagree from time to time. There's nothing wrong with that, I might add, as long as we remain open and willing to work together to achieve and resolve, rather, those differences. And I believe one of the keys to ensuring that continued and open dialogue is the exchange of creative and cultural, uh, cultural content. Film and television are serious means by which our two nations and our two peoples can grow closer together. It's very hard to remain in permanent conflict with people who share your love of art, including the art of filmmaking. Not only as one to look to President Obama's recent visit to China to see how far our relationship has come, not only was it an historic agreement reached on climate change, a breakthrough uh, deal, eliminating tariffs on dozens of high-tech products, and an arrangement to develop rules ensuring our militaries avoid accidental confrontations, but were also achieved during that historic visit. None of this have been possible, in my view, if not in part, if not in part, for the greater openness brought on by our cultural exchanges, including the growing relationship in film. As a representative of the American film and television industries, I would like to see more of our films released in China. That will be not a great surprise to you, Ambassador Shui. In fact, I have made the point at every one of my meetings that I'd like to see more of our films have access to a Chinese audience, that we ought to lift those numerical quotas that are placed some limitations on the amount of films that can be seen in China. And further, I'd like to ask how we could receive more support containing, uh, containing the theft and piracy of our products. But I also want to see more of the innovative content being created by Chinese filmmakers coming to the United States so our audiences here can enjoy them as well. A society which opens itself up by encouraging its creators to tell authentic stories, freely sharing who they are with the world, is one with the ability to grow and expand its opportunities. And I want our two societies to continue growing individually and with, and with uh, one another as well. So I thank all of you this evening for the high honor of inviting me to be with you, sharing some thoughts this evening about this growing relationship between our two countries in this one space. It doesn't solve every problem, I know that. But if we continue to work together in this space, that I believe ultimately the great benefits will accrue to both of our great nations. And I thank you very, very for listening. Thank you very much.